everybody, Todd here, and I hope you're having a great week. I've been in the middle of a 64 channel upgrade to my studio, so I thought it'd be a good time to talk about patch base. So whether you're recording or mixing in the studio, you need to have your gear connected to get things done. Now, sometimes it might just be a microphone, an instrument, studio monitors, maybe a little bit of outboard gear, headphones. Maybe you have enough I.O. that you can plug everything into your interface and that's it. You're ready to go. Other times you may not have enough and you need to swap things in and out. Now, if you have a desktop audio interface, not so bad. Jacks are accessible. Plug and unplug things as you need them. Of course, if your interface or gear is in a rack, not as convenient at all. And especially if you can't get around to the back, it's a real hassle. Now, even if you have enough I.O. on your audio interface, you may want to have more flexibility of how to route that gear. That's where patch base come in. They give us a convenient way to get our gear connected the way we want it, when we want it. Now, just like cables and gear, patch bays are available with a variety of connector types. Now, the most common we'll find in the home or project studio is going to be TRS or XLR. But for higher channel counts, there are TT or Bantam style patch bays, and even hardwired options have been popular in large studios. Today, I'm going to take a look at TRS. We'll talk about how to wire them up, what they do, and where you might want to use them. I have a few patch bays for us to look at here. I have three TRS style patch bays and two XLR patch bays. First, I'll show you this Behringer PX3000. This is the least expensive patch bay I have here. It has 48 patch points on the front and corresponding 48 on the back. You'll see they're numbered one to 24 rows A and B. Now this unit allows us to route audio through and use also a mode called half normal and a mode called normal. Now the difference in these is simply this through means is that anything that I connect in the back is going to be routed straight out through the front and nothing else. So we have 48 connections. I can change each, each uh, row, if you will, or each column so that I have no connections going through top to bottom. So if I had that in through mode, that's what I'd get. Now, sometimes I might want to have a situation though, where I have a patch where I have audio coming in that normally goes out to something in the back. So this could be like audio coming in from outboard gear going to the input on uh, an interface. And so if I want to do that, I can use either normal or half normal. So if I put it in half normal mode, what that means is that when nothing is plugged in the front, audio coming in through the top jack will automatically be sent out through the bottom jack. So really handy. I don't have to, you know, have a cable in the front connected top and bottom. But what happens with half normal is that when I plug a cable into the top, I now have the audio that's coming in the top at the back coming out the top at the front as well as out the bottom at the back. So the signal remains connected at the back, but I now have another cable with signal that I can patch into something else. So it becomes like a splitter. On the other hand, if I plug a cable into the bottom jack on the front, that will interrupt the connection and now whatever signal I send in through the cable from the front is going to go out the bottom. And, and that again allows us to access whatever is connected to the bottom jack here. I can of course use both of them, but now what happens since I've already broken the connection with the bottom, I really just have two throughs. So in through the back top comes out the top front and then in through the bottom front goes out through the bottom in the back. So that's half normal. Now in a normal situation, again, we have audio coming in through the top at the back that's routed out through the bottom at the back. But in this case, when I plug a cable into the top, I'm going to break that connection. And now I will only have audio coming in the top back, out the top front, and nothing will be connected to the bottom back. Of course, again, I can plug a cable into the bottom front, and now I have two throughs. Again, bottom top in, front top out, front bottom in, back bottom out. So again, three modes on this patch bay, really useful depending on, you know, what type of gear you have connected up. If you're using some outboard analog gear and you want to have that routed through your audio interface inputs and outputs. Now this is a very inexpensive patch bay, under $100 so US funds at the time of recording. And you'll see that all of the patch points are just simply routed through the chassis. They're not mounted to the chassis here. Same on the back. And there's a little bit of movement. It's a little loose. There's a, a circuit board inside that everything is mounted to. So it's an inexpensive option, um, depending if you do a lot of plugging and unplugging, may not be as durable as some of the others. And of course, if you have a lot of snake cables hanging off the back here, there could be a lot of weight. 
Now, another TRS patch bay we'll look at is this ART P48. And here again, I have 48 patch points at the front with corresponding 48 at the back. Now, this particular unit has two modes. It has half normal and regular full normal, and, and so no dedicated through mode. As we saw earlier, of course, we can end up with through by having two cables plugged in front and back in, in any of the modes. But here again, we get half normal and normal. I won't go through the connections again because so we looked at them already with the Behringer. Here, however, that switch is on the back. And you see, it's just a push button switch between the two jacks for either normal or half normal. And you know, this is again in behind. When we have this in a rack, we can't get to it so easily. And so that can be an issue. Now, the other thing to watch too, is as you're plugging and unplugging cables here, it could be easy to accidentally push one of these switches and end up things, uh, you know, in the, in the mode that you're not wanting to have. So that's just something to be aware with this. This unit also has the jacks mounted to a PCB board inside, uh, but they feel quite a bit more solid than the uh, Behringer. There's not a much movement on this one. And then the final TRS patch bay I'm gonna look at is this Samson S patch. This unit is uh, significantly heavier than the other two. Again, we have 48 patch points coming through the front and 48 through the back. First thing you'll notice is all the connections on the back are actually attached to the chassis with a nut to secure them. And so you're gonna get a lot more strength. Again, you know, if you have 48 cables hanging off the back of here, uh, there can be, you know, on a snake where they're all connected, you can have a lot of weight pulling this and that can put some strain on these jacks. So this is, this is certainly a lot more durable type of construction. This unit also allows us to have through half normal and full normal, so three modes, but here you'll notice the switches are on the front again for each pair. So that allows us to make changes without pulling this from the rack and that's really a convenient thing to have. Uh, on the downside, there isn't a whole lot of room for labeling. And so if you, you, know, you want to be able to label these, uh, a lot of people have issue with that. You know, if you have blanks on top and bottom, then you've got lots of room to write something. But if you got to do it on here, um, it's, it's not the easiest. There are labels for these that are ready made. You can use a six millimeter um, P-Touch type label as well. They will fit here, but it's pretty tight. You can see that of the three TRS patch bays, the, the S patch has the least amount of room for labeling, but is the most durable. Now, the next type of patch bay we'll take a look at here is an XLR patch bay. And again, XLR, a different format, still a balanced format. These were all TRS balanced, by the way. These are both a balanced XLR. Now, the first one I'm looking at here is an ART P16. It has 16 through. So again, we have 16 on the front, 16 on the back. There is no such thing as normal or half normal on this patch bay. Everything just goes through from front to back. So if I have a signal coming into the back, I'll go ahead and make that connection. It's simply going to go ahead and come out of the front of the unit. And I can do the same thing. I can run a signal into the front and out the back. Now, the issue here is that, of course, the XLR is not reversible, right? So we have all female connectors on the front in this case, all male on the back. Now they make the rack ears reversible and the idea is we can flip that so then we'd have all the males on the front and all the females on the back. So if we have two of these, one facing in each direction, we can accomplish basically what we do with a through connection with the TRS. Now, again, XLR is great in that we can have, you know, connections lock into place a, a little more easily. You notice these jacks do not have locks like this other one I have sitting here uh, on, on the female side. But still, I mean, as a patch bay, this actually works quite well. Then we'll look at the last one here, and that's the HOSA. And the difference with the HOSA is that unlike these previous four patch bays that are all using a PCB inside, so everything is all hardwired in there, here, each individual jack is wired to the corresponding one on the back. And so the nice thing is you can flip them around. And uh, so you'll see here on this HOSA, it's a 12, and I have eight female connections on the front and four male connections on the back. And of course, when you flip that over, you have the females on the back and the males on the back here. So the nice thing about that is, is let's say I'm in a studio situation and I can, on these, these eight, I could have eight preamps, all right? So I, from the back, what we would do is we would bring our preamp inputs and so we could plug them all in and have that accessible on the front. 
Then we have our microphone set up in our recording area. And I'll just go ahead and plug one in here. And so those are coming in. So now I have preamps and I have microphones. And again, I could have as many as I can fit. In this case, again, I've got a total of 12 connections. I can reverse one or 12. It doesn't matter whatever mix of gear you have. But the nice thing with this, if I'm using it for microphones, is that if I have, again, these eight preamps on the front and four microphones I want to access, what I can do is simply go ahead and say, all right, if I'm using the microphone that's connected to input nine, which preamp do I want to use? I'll connect it up to preamp number one, then I have it and I've made the connection. If I want to go ahead and connect it into preamp that's connected to number four, I can go ahead and do that as well. Or say I've decided I want to use a different microphone. Well, I can move over to one of the other microphones. So this kind of layout, if you only have room for one XLR patch bay, is really convenient. Again, with the HOSA unit, that's one of the things I really like about this one is that it's easy to flip the jacks around. Now, I always like to say that you'll know when it's time for a patch bay. It usually happens right around when you get really frustrated with plugging and unplugging things or you can't just get the configuration you want. So a good time to think about it is whenever you add or change gear up. You gotta do rewiring anyways. That's the time to think about a patch base so you can get what you need to get done now, as well as have room for expansion in the future. Now, if you like this video, check out one of the other videos on the screen. As always, I really appreciate you joining me today, and I'll see you next time.